You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. This is a bonus episode. Bonus. We just released episode 67 about the La Brea Tar Pits. Mm -hmm. This is a bonus companion to that episode, which we're calling Voices of La Brea. Some supplemental data for you. See, we were in Southern California for NAPC recently, Mm -hmm. as you've heard if you've listened to recent episodes of the podcast. And while we were there, not only did we take the opportunity to learn about La Brea, But we actually got to hang out and sit down with some of the La Brea crew. Yeah. And a bunch of them agreed to let us interview them, pick their their brains a little bit about their work that they do there, their history, their favorite things about working at La Brea. And that's what this is going to be. This is a little anthology of short interviews. Yes. Some, Some, a collection of our favorite hits. Of everyone we talked to. <laughs> a collection of our favorite parts of all the audio we recorded. Yes. It's literally everything. In this audio, you will hear from such famed people as Dr. Emily Lindsay, Assistant Curator and Excavation Site Director, Dr. Myrene Belisi, who is an NSF Postdoctoral Research Fellow, uh, Laura, Sean, and Connie, who are all preparators nice. at the site, and... At the end, a whole bunch of students who are part of the La Brea Tar Pits Field School. It was a lot of fun getting getting a bunch of these together. It was really cool. Huge thanks to everyone who agreed to sit down with us for a bit and share their voices with us. And speaking of other voices, without any further ado, enjoy Voices of La Brea. Hello, Dr. Lindsay. Hello, David. Please introduce yourself for our listeners. Dr. Emily Lindsay, Assistant Curator and Excavation Site Director at La Brea Tarpets. Cool. Thank you for sitting down to talk with us today. Thanks for having me. So what does that title mean? What does the Assistant Curator and Excavation Site Director do? So as the curator at the museum, I'm in charge of all the research and collections activities that happen. Uh, This includes the excavations that we have ongoing in the park. It includes the preparation of fossils and and study and identification in our lab and the management of the collections. And it also includes conducting research on the collections and uh, coordinating and collaborating with researchers from around the world who are conducting research on the collections. And that sounds like it would be a substantial job in any institution, but the La Brea (laughs) collections are huge and La Brea is, is, is enormously popular What is it, among researchers. So what is it like to be in that position at one of the premier fossil sites in the world? You know, it's, it's a real privilege to be there. There's an incredible wealth of data that we are able to get from our collections that you can't get from a lot of other fossil sites, which is part of what makes it such a unique and important site. The mm-hmm. fact that we have uh, plant macrofossils as well as bones of everything from little rodents and songbirds up to giant ground sloths and mammoths. Uh, We also have insect material preserved, we have shells from aquatic invertebrates, so we have an incredible almost ecosystem level representation of what Los Angeles has looked like over the last 50,000 years. So, So just from a purely scientific research perspective, it's it's incredible. And because of that collection, there's, of course, a lot of interest in, from researchers uh, at institutions around the world in uh, investigating particular aspects of ecology and evolution and extinction at our site. Um, now, because we are also happen to be in the middle of the third largest city in North America, <laughs> there <laughs> is uh, a sort of high... Uh, visitor attendance at the museum, so I coordinate as sort of the the representative of the research at the museum, I coordinate with our exhibits department, with our education department, with our gallery interpretation staff, our guest relations, um, 
our our, our gift shop, everything yeah. about you know <laughs> ma- ensuring that what is represented to the public about the museum is scientifically accurate and up to date. And then on top of that. Um, for people who have never heard of Los Angeles before, it's about three miles from Hollywood. So there's actually a huge uh, component of, of media attention at the site, um, in part because of the type of site it is, and in part because it's a really site, a really easy place for people with uh, video cameras and uh, and and publications behind them to get to. And so I also do a lot of. Uh, the interviews, you know, when there are questions about fossils that have been discovered or when uh, people want to come and uh, talk about what were saber tooth cats like or what's a great thing to do with families in Los Angeles, you know, a lot of... Um, a lot of times I'm sort of the, the face of the tar pit. The for point those person. Type. I'm sort of the point person for those types of wow. uh, interviews as well. Very cool. How often do you get to directly interact with guests? Um, so I don't directly interact with guests very often. You know, I do sometimes lead kind of high-level VIP tours. Uh, right, right. And occasionally, you know, I'll be out talking with the excavators at the excavation site, and people will come to the fence and ask questions, and I'll, you know, go up and chat with them. But right. it's not a major component of my job. Okay. All right, yeah. With all of that to do, do you ever get the chance to go into collections? I, I got to go into the collections yesterday on the tour and just look at some cool fossils and, and <laughs> marvel at the Geek amazing stuff in bit. there. Yeah. Sometimes I do just when I need to take a little break. I'll get up <laughs> and just walk through the collections and just sort of be in awe of what we've collected over the last hundred years and what we still don't know mm-hmm. uh, from the site that's been the focus of such intense scrutiny for so long. And are you conducting your own research on La Brea fossils as well? Yeah, so I have a number of projects that uh, collaborators and I are working on. Um, I have four postdocs that I advise um, who are collecting research on different aspects of our collections. Um, I also have uh, collaborations with researchers from other institutions. Um, looking at you know everything from questions about a particular fossil and how can we leverage new technologies to uh, learn something new about an animal that died 30,000 years ago to really whole scale uh, investigations of um, the site itself and how were the different deposits actively uh, accumulating and preserving fossil material over thousands of years, what was the time scale of that, um, what are say, sort of geomorphological or taphonomic differences between the seeps. Uh, I personally do a lot of research involving radiocarbon dating and a lot of research looking at the extinction event that wiped out about two-thirds of the mammals in North America and much of the rest of the world that happened at the end of the Pleistocene. And so um, that's a major focus of my research and, and the La Brea Tar Pits because the time period they cover encompasses uh, that extinction event. Um, it's a really great place to ask those types of questions as well. Right. Cool. Very nice. So before all of, of this, how did you end up at La Brea? So I actually did my doctoral work excavating a tar pit site in Ecuador. So oh. a lot of people who come to La Brea don't know, probably most people don't know, as I used to not know, <laughs> that there are other tar pit sites elsewhere in the world. We have a few of them in Southern California um, because of this combination of oil reserves and tectonic activity that sometimes creates these fissures, these areas of structural weakness where, where that oil can make its way to the surface. Uh, but we also have, um, we find these sorts of deposits in a few other parts of the world where you have that same combination of, of oil and earthquakes. So um, the Pacific coast of North America, Ecuador and Peru have tar pits. Uh, Venezuela has tar pits. There are some tar pits from the Caribbean that we've started investigating. And actually, since I've started my job, I've discovered that there are even tar pits in other places that... Um, I 
didn't know about before. There are tar pits in Azerbaijan, there are tar pits wow. in Japan, and there are tar pits, I'm told, in Iran. And so, you know, it turns out once you start looking for something, uh, they start popping out of the woodwork. And so, one of the things that I've been really building at La Brea is a program to go out and investigate these other asphaltic seeps and really build relationships with researchers and institutions that are involved in investigating the paleontology of these super important deposits. Um, you know, the La Brea Tar Pits is remarkable and it's an incredibly rich and productive site, but we actually have a pretty good fossil record uh, in Southern California in the absence of the tar pits because of all the fluvial activity that has uh, happened over the last 100,000 years or so. Whereas um, in other parts of the world, especially places like the Neotropics, where you have really poor fossil preservation, these sites are even more important because not only are they capturing and preserving this wide variety of uh, biological information, but they often represent uh, some of the only fossil assemblages that you can find in these regions. And so um, having a better understanding of the paleoecology of a place like uh, Peru or Ecuador or Venezuela or Trinidad and how that changed over the last, you know, 40,000 years of climate change and human arrival and extinction is incredibly valuable. So you must have colleagues all over the world that you work with. Yeah, so we have um, built a network of colleagues um, and, you know, starting back when I was working in Ecuador, I have colleagues in Ecuador and Peru uh, and Venezuela that are um, sort of participating in this sort of tar pits research program. I also personally do a lot of work in South America outside of asphaltic context, and so I have um, dozens of researchers, South American paleontologists, archaeologists, paleoclimatologists that I collaborate with trying to understand sort of larger scale patterns of uh, climate and human driven changes and extinction across the Lake Quaternary. Excellent. Cool. Did you grow up in California? No, I'm actually from Portland, Oregon. Oh, so. Okay. Just not too far away. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough to have known about all the cool fossil stuff going on down in California. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I knew about it. You know, I um, I didn't always, I didn't come to paleontology until quite late in the game. I actually I was a marine biologist uh, in okay. college and for a few years after college. Um, but I sort of had this secret double life in archaeology and I would like <laughs> sneak off and work on archaeological digs. And, you know, my friends were always saying, well, you like animals and you like dead things, why not paleontology? And I always thought, oh, it's just like people describing new species of dinosaurs. It's not interesting <laughs> to me. Um, but I was really captivated by like the systems aspect of ecology and sort of how you can analyze, you know, when something changes in a system, how does that impact the other components of the system? And at some point um, between undergrad and, and grad school, I was introduced to this idea that you can actually ask those same systems types of questions in ecosystems that don't exist anymore. And I just found that inc incredibly compelling. And I was like, that is what I want to do. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's right. awesome. Yeah. And then you ended up at one of the best places in the world to do that. And, and it just worked <laughs> out. I, there was definitely an element of luck involved. <laughs> Wonderful. Before we wrap up, what is your favorite thing about working at La Brea? That is a hard question. <laughs> um, so I'll say three. One okay. is that it is one of the only sites on Earth that preserves this comprehensive ecosystem scale record of change and the power, the scientific power that that has to not only help us understand the past, but to understand what may be happening now in the face of analogous climate and human caused changes. Two is the opportunity to reach people at all levels of society and teach them uh, not only about things like ecological change and extinction and evolution, but about the scientific process itself. Because when visitors come to our museum, they are able to see the entire process of paleontology in one place. They can see the active discovery of fossils in the excavations. They can see those same fossils being prepared and studied in the lab, and then they can see the 
results of that study presented through museum exhibits and um, to be able to sort of showcase that and help people better understand the scientific process, how it relates to activities that they do in their everyday lives and why it's trustable is incredibly important, especially right now at this point in American society. Agreed. And number three is giant sloths. <laughs> that is a good reason to work anywhere. I can absolutely agree with that. That's awesome. <laughs> Dr. Lindsay, thank you so much for sitting down to talk with us. Thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Oh, it's been wonderful. Hello, Dr. Belisi. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. Please introduce yourself for the podcast. Uh, my name is Myrene Belisi, Dr. Belisi, and I am a researcher at La Brea Tar Vincent Museum in Los Angeles, and my official title is quite long. Um, I'm a National Science Foundation postdoctoral research fellow in biology. Okay. So oh. what this means is that I'm funded for three years to investigate um, some specimens at La Brea Target, some research questions there. Cool. And, and what kind of research questions are you looking to answer? Um, so at the Tar Pits, we are pretty well known for our large mammalian carnivores and large mammalian herbivores as well. Um, so these big things, they were pretty charismatic. There are things like the saber-toothed cat, the dire wolf, short-faced bear, American lion. Um, and I've been studying those um, bigger animals for a while. I started at La Brea um, unofficially as a visiting researcher about 10 years ago. So in 2009, I was doing my master's and um, I visited La Brea for my yeah. master's uh, in order to uh, look at how these, what these different big species were eating. Now, as I uh, continued studying these big charismatic things, I started realizing, um, well, there are small things too, and the quality <laughs> of preservation at La Brea is good enough that those small things are also preserved. And so um, from the bigger carnivores like the saber tooth, I, I'm now branching out to smaller um, mammalian carnivores like gray foxes, bobcats, um, even weasels, cool. and all of those are also prefer or preserved at the tarpits, not to the same degree as the saber tooths because those are preserved in thousands. So we're lucky to have you know a dozen, two dozen weasels, but that's still a decent sample uh, sample size to start with. Were you studying carnivores and then it? happened to be that you got over to La Brea to do more of that research, or did you want to go to La Brea and this was the thing that, you know, sort of the research that was available? Yeah, La Brea is kind of the spot for carnivore research, okay. uh, well, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes <laughs> so, sense. Uh, yeah, so I got my start as a researcher there studying these um, large carnivores, and then um, I guess I think of myself as um, a community ecologist who works in the fossil record and the community that I'm interested in, mammalian carnivores. And um, yeah, and so La Brea is the spot for that. Very cool. Are you from this area? Are you from California? Um, I'm actually not from California. I was born in the Philippines. Okay. And um, the first time I heard about La Brea was on the Powerpuff Girls. Um, oh, really? <laughs> nice. Yeah, I know everyone else has this, you know, everyone else is like, oh, I went to La Brea as a kid and I loved it. So I didn't have that experience, but I did have the experience of like, oh, one of the Powerpuff Girls was going to drop like Mojo Jojo into the La Brea <laughs> right. Tarpids or whatever. Yeah. That's so, fantastic. So that's <laughs> that's oh, how wow. I was introduced to it non-scientifically. and oh, then Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Powerpuff Girls. And then um, scientifically, though, um, I got introduced to La Brea um, when I was in college. And um, so, okay, I was born in the Philippines, and then my entire family moved here when I was in high school. Then I went to college in Northern California, at UC Berkeley. And Berkeley, um, their bell tower has tar pits fossils right oh. from La Brea because some of the uh, earlier excavations at La Brea were done by Berkeley. And so um, for an undergrad class that I took, uh, we had to work with some of these uh, fossils from the bell tower. So it was literally undergrads, you know, with carts of these brown stained bones. Um, 
falling over uh, fossils at UC Berkeley um, back in 2007 or 2008 um, from the bell tower where they were stored um, over to the uh, very large science building that where we were um, where we were working. Very cool. That's awesome. When uh, I, I was on the tour behind the scenes at La Brea mm-hmm. just the other day, and I've been in the exhibits, and in the exhibits you can see that wall of dire wolves. Mm-hmm. And then when we went back into the collections, there is this, there are drawers and drawers and drawers in this one row, walking down, I was walking down this row for like five minutes, and it was all saber tooth skulls. Uh-huh. All the way down. Mm-hmm. Now for me, someone who is sort of just generally interested in paleontology, that was really cool. Mm-hmm. For someone who actually studies these animals, it it must be incredible to get to sit in those collections rooms and be surrounded by literally thousands of specimens for you to study. Mm-hmm. Yes, it definitely feels like a privilege to be able to do that. And yeah, I've, I've just been incredibly lucky and um, to have had mentors to guide me um, to where I am now and be able to study these boats. Very yeah. cool. Out of all of the carnivores at La Brea that you get the the privilege of looking at, do you have a favorite? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're not listening. Don't worry. I know. Well, okay. I've mentioned the saber-toothed cat a couple of different times, um, so I guess that's one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> um, my favorite small carnivore, though, must be the gray fox. Okay, yeah, cool. You know, I just, there's just something about its skull that, like, it has a U on the top of its skull. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me is very cute. Mm-hmm. Um, but also they're, you know, they're a dog. And um, for, this is separate from La Brea, but for my dissertation, I worked on North American fossil dogs. And the gray fox is one of them, but it's also very different from um, from the rest of the fossil dogs because, uh, so fossil dogs arose in North America about 40 million years ago. So like, a few orders of magnitude older than La Brea, which is 40,000, 55,000 years ago. Um, so fossil dogs, uh, very North American um, family. And uh, a lot of them, well, not a lot, uh, only a quarter of them, but still more than what we have today, a quarter of them became large predators. And so the gray fox is not that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and so that what that's what makes it incredible to me that it as well as the coyote um they survived the last ice age and all the other changes that came with that we still have them today yeah which is impressive it is it is are there different questions you can ask about the big the big things like the the saber-toothed cats and the lions and dire wolves versus foxes and coyotes. Obviously, they're different size classes. They're living slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Can you answer different research questions between them? Yes, definitely. So um, one research question that I worked on uh, with the saber-toothed cats and the dire wolves is pathology. So, um, and this is, studies on pathology are possible uh, because at the tar pits, because we have so many specimens of these right. so um, you're looking at species, diseases and injury. And exactly. Such. So um, records of injuries on these, the bones of these species, and um, that sort of analysis isn't possible with the gray fox, for example, at La Brea, just because we don't have as many of them. Okay. Higher numbers. Yeah, higher numbers in order to. Um, quantify patterns in the skull. So, for example, uh, for the saber-toothed cat and dire wolf, um, my collaborator and I, uh, we looked at over 300 individuals of saber-toothed cat and dire wolf separately from one pit alone. Wow. Whereas, you know, we do not have that number of gray fox. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so from that study... Um, digressing a little bit, but since I mentioned this study, I figured mm-hmm. I should finish telling you about it. Sure, sure. Uh, from that study, we figured out that um, that dire wolves, their injuries tended to be more concentrated. And these are traumatic injuries, so maybe they were... Um, it, it was chronic uh, injuries that um, were the result of a lifetime of hunting. And so right, right. dire wolves, they, were, uh, they would get injured on um, their skull, for example, and also on their feet. So imagine uh, their prey, like a bison or something, mm-hmm. like kicking them. 
Right, right. Um, because the direwolves would be chasing after the prey. Yes. Whereas the direwolf, or sorry, the uh, saber toothed cat, its injuries were more concentrated along the midline of its body. So um, around its spine and its ribs, where the ribs meet the spine. And so if you think about the saber toothed cat and, you know, for example, a giant brown sloth, like, grappling together Mm -hmm. um and the saber tooth is like wrestling and twisting around toward his back um so that uh these injuries make sense if you consider that it might have been moving that way yeah Yeah. interesting so the pounce versus the chase exactly yeah ambush predator versus um chasing or running a personal predator you get to answer a lot of questions when you have thousands of oh yeah (laughs) bones to work from (laughs) Totally, so much data, <laughs> so rare. <laughs> so, uh, you've been with La Brea for a while, uh, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I've been a visiting researcher uh, for a decade, but then um, officially a postdoc only say, only for the past nine months. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, of course, eventually a postdoc ends. Hopefully, eventually mm-hmm. a postdoc ends. <laughs> do you want to, is it your plan to stay at La Brea or do you have sort of your sights set on oh, other man. places? I, it would be wonderful to stay at La Brea. <laughs> I don't know how much control academics have <laughs> over where they end up. Yeah. But, true. you know, I mentioned earlier it's been a privilege to be at La Brea and um, clearly I just keep coming back <laughs> because it's yeah. such an incredible site. Um, so it would be awesome if I could continue to come back, even if not based at La Brea, but just to continue doing research there, even uh, based at another place. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any, are there any uh, a sort of dream localities for you uh, thinking about comparing with La Brea or doing similar research? Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite sites in North America is the John Day Fossil Beds. Have okay. you two been? I am there? aware of them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and um, so it's incredible. It's totally not the same um, at all uh, as La Brea, for example. It's much older. Um, it's you know millions of years old rather than thousands of years old. But it's just um, so that time is a hotspot for North American fossil dogs, which um, I mentioned earlier. I studied in my dissertation, yeah. and um, so that was a time where. North American fossil dogs were still small, like more like raccoons, and this was before they became uh, large predators. And so um, that time to me, I, it would be awesome to be able to just compare um, that ecosystem, like, like the range of uh, morphologies or ecological adaptations of those animals in that ecosystem, compare that to what we have at La Brea and I have um I actually have a few other sites as well I just I tend to I tend to have multiple answers to you know yeah. <laughs> like oh which site would you like to give um you have a wish list yeah I have a wish list absolutely and, yeah, <laughs> as I, you should of course yeah and I think it's because um you know like I said I think in terms of communities and um there's so much you know North America is a uh, big continent and um some of the things that i've found in my other work um my non La Brea work is well there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of like uh community composition and stuff like that right it's different in different parts of the continent yeah, different exactly. sites yeah very cool nice. well hopefully you'll get to do all this <laughs> awesome you. research in all these places thank you yeah i hope to visit the gray as well. Yeah, <laughs> I yes. I haven't been, but Come I know. Come on up. Hearing... We will give you the deluxe tour. Thank you. I'll take you up on that for sure. What is your favorite thing about working at La Brea? My favorite thing? Um, well, it's such a weird site. <laughs> it's so weird in that, um, you know, not just in terms of numbers of specimens, but also in terms of, well, this is a site that's right in the middle of a big city. It's a site that you know the creators of powerpuff girls knew about and (laughs) and like a bunch of other media also know about and it's um and so it provides this opportunity that i think is unparalleled for science communication and um that's part of the appeal of the site to me and it's it like it's it's relatable to people um 
because a lot of people in LA have been there before, or if they're not from LA, you know, their their attention is immediately like captivated by this weird thing that's right in the middle of a big city, uh, one of the biggest cities um, in North America. Um, so that's probably my favorite thing that it's it's paleontology like you're doing your field work yeah. <laughs> but you're also uh but everything is also accessible not just in terms of you know oh you can go home to your apartment at the end of the day but also like you can just go outside and meet people who <laughs> ask you questions yeah yeah it's pretty fascinating how just because most fossil sites but almost all fossil sites don't have that luxury of becoming world famous even among non-experts, we get every, probably once uh, every several tours I give at the Great Fossil Site, someone will look out there and say, were these the tar pits? Yes. Like, were there tar pits trapping animals? Because that image of tar pits is so embedded in the public mind because of La Brea. Wow. They ask about dinosaurs. <laughs> they ask about the Ice Age. They yep. also ask us about dinosaurs. Yep. <laughs> and occasionally they'll ask about tar pits. Those uh-huh. are like the three biggest things wow. that people know. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, um, Sean Campbell is going to give a talk to us about the Gray Fossil Site. So hopefully we will also Good. have people asking us about the Gray Fossil Site soon enough. Wonderful. We're crossing the stream. Yeah, nice. yeah totally. <laughs> Dr. Belisi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, both of you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Hi, Laura. (laughs) Hi, David. Please introduce yourself. Uh, My name is Laura Tewksbury-Wall, and I am a senior preparator here at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum. And what does it mean to be a senior preparator? It means I've been here for a while, and I help excavate the fossils from Project 23, the ongoing excavation outside. Okay, excellent. Now, so you were just telling me that Whereas most of Project 23 is still in these big crates that were pulled out of the asphalt deposit, your box, your crate, has been reduced down to something delightfully manageable looking. (laughs) Definitely. So it started out, uh, Box 14 is one of the larger of the deposits, about 86,000 pounds when we first started digging. And it's already easily had tens of thousands of fossils come out of it. Once a laboratory eventually gets through every single lizard scale, mouse toe, <laughs> insect leg, seed pod, freshwater snail shell, if they tell me it ends up being over 100,000 fossils out of this one deposit, I won't really be that surprised. It's wow. been especially dense on the microfossils. Um, but at the same time, we got to the point that towards the end of the deposit, it was still very dense on fossils, but we started having a lot of issues with wood rot and termite damage in oh. the box itself. These boxes were only originally projected to last five years, starting in August of 2008. So we've pushed them past their prime a bit, <laughs> so it's fair. Uh, but we started getting to the point that we were so worried about really structural integrity of the deposit and the safety of ourselves and our volunteers working on this deposit, that what we ended up doing was making a burlap and plaster belt. So not a full jacket, but just a belt to help stabilize what was left of the deposit, kind of attached it to the floorboards, took a fancy sawzall and cut out that section of the floor, uh, put it on casters so we're actually able to continue working on the deposit, but in a more stable uh, and uh, much nicer workspace now. Oh, nice. So has this, so we're actually, the, the listeners can't see this, but we're sitting <laughs> next to this little, this small jacket full of tar and fossils. Asphalt. And Asphalt fossils. and fossils. Asphalt. And sediment. And sediment. So 10 years to get it down to this level? Um, this deposit in particular has been worked on off and on okay. throughout this whole time. So it was originally started July 20th, 2010, but it has not been continually worked on that entire period of time. Okay. It's been a very good ambassador for the project. It's very visibly accessible for the public to see. So it's been put on hold periodically. Um, it's also been very good for when we have media days and that sort of thing. It was a very good deposit for them right, to come right. see. But then we did have to start focusing on it just this last year or so when we started having the structural integrity issues. Um, But it's still at least another couple of months and several thousand fossils, even just in this tiny space that you could probably hug it if you stretch your arms really far. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. And is this, so you're uh, working with the field school. Mm -hmm. Is, do you have field school crew helping you out with this Yes, box? so uh, during this period of time, we have field school students that are helping us prepare these fossils, and they're dealing with my uh, 
not frustration, such a harsh word, <laughs> but the challenge of trying to figure out which fossils have to come out before we can get this other fossil out, before we can get this other fossil out. We have kind of an embarrassment of riches. Right. And especially in some of these areas, there are a lot of sticks, a lot of plant fossils. Most likely California live oak and juniper, the two most common that we've been finding this particular deposit. But um, whereas something like a humerus, so an upper front leg of an animal, I can predict what type of shape that is, where it's going to be, and I can tell them, all right, this is where the end of it should be. Here's how we can get that out. Something like a stick, <laughs> much harder for me because I don't know the particular patterns that they follow, and sometimes right. they just do whatever they want to. Um, and they tend to be a lot more relatively fragile because also the structure of them absorbs much more humidity out of the air and that sort of thing. So we have to be much right. more mindful of keeping them in situ and not letting them kind of warp out of position while we're working on things. It sounds like the type of work you're doing from crate to crate in this, pro in this project and other deposits you're working on, there must it must be a new animal, so to speak, every <laughs> time you're excavating a new deposit. Yes, so it's definitely a different snapshot in time and challenge from deposit to deposit, but then also from within the deposit, from one area to another. Um, usually our deposits are roughly conical in shape, and each of the boxes tried to isolate particular deposits and giving room around the outside edges to help keep structural integrity. But sometimes the deposit kind of does what it wants to, or <laughs> things got shifted around, or one deposit tapers off and a different type of situation starts showing up. So we really just have to play it by ear, deal with the fossils that are in front of us, and be very nimble and continue to change our, our approach depending on what's right in front of us. Right, right. So how did you end up here at La Brea? Um, so I was one of those classic kids at four that told my parents I want to be a paleontologist <laughs> and just never changed my mind. Or maybe grew up past four. I'm not sure. Right, right. <laughs> um, when I was 12, I stated that I wanted to specialize in a paleo behavioralist. And they Ooh. were like, sure, kid, whatever you want. <laughs> um, but they were lovely and supportive and helped get me resources. So I started doing a lot of um, both volunteer work and work at a lot of the junior colleges, actually working on preparing fossils from local construction sites. Because okay. um, I grew up... Uh, that chunk of my life in Orange County of California, which had a lot of construction during that time period and a lot of paleo monitoring projects that would then work with a lot of local schools to help prepare some of those fossils. And then I started out here as a volunteer back in 2006. And then in 2008, when Project 23 came about, they were like, hey, you have the right background. You do a good job. You want a job? It's only going to be for five years, though. And I said, well, that sounds great. <laughs> and then uh, next week is actually my 13-year anniversary grand total. Oh, wow. So, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but us here at the Tarpists tend to stick around. Yeah. Oh, I, oh yeah. very clever. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sure you've never heard that joke or will continue to never yes, hear that joke I'm sure again. each of these interviews will have <laughs> tar puns. So in all that time you've been working here, all the work you've done, do you have a favorite project or a favorite specimen that you've gotten to work on? Well, I do have a favorite species that we find here. Okay. So I love them all. It's like picking a favorite child. You can't possibly do that. But if I did have to, it would be uh, Capromeryx minor. Uh, it's a species of dwarf pronghorn. So when you think of like home on the range, the deer and the antelope play, we don't have antelope here in North America. Right. But we also don't have buffalo, but we call them buffalo and yes. antelope <laughs> instead of bison and pronghorn. I understand. Old world, new world. Um, but we actually had a dwarf species uh, that lived here. Uh, so my volunteers and field school students know when they found a fossil of that particular animal because my voice gets to a very particular pitch of excited and squeaky. <laughs> um, and it's been a very eventful week because we've actually been finding multiple fossils of that species every day so far this week. That's very exciting. I also can't help but notice that your earrings look like direwolf jaws? Is that what that is? Um, they are carnivorans, but these are actually modern bones of mustelids. So little, I believe they're mink. Oh, uh, but okay. one of my coworkers knows how much I love bones. <laughs> and also my field school students just these last couple of days have been studying uh, skulls and jaws in their functional morphology lectures. I see. So I decided to challenge them with my jewelry today. Very nice. So I had assumed that those were casts that were shrunken down, but those oh, are actual, actual bones. individual bone, yep. That's really cool. And the teeth are gorgeous, so it makes me happy. Oh, very nice. The listeners can't see this, but I'll get a picture, though. Maybe <laughs> I'll get a photo of this, and we can show it off. So 
when, it, obviously, La Brea is an incredible fossil site. It's unlike any other site in the world. You have done a lot of work on a lot of things. What is your favorite thing about working at the La Brea Tar Pits? So I'm going to cheat and have three parts to my answer. Okay, go right ahead. So my favorite things about working here are that I get to dig for buried treasure for my job. Nice. That I get to hang out with amazing people while I do it. And that I get to so actively help get other people excited about science. Not just my coworkers, but also we're in the major urban center of Los Angeles. I mean, people are just like hanging out in the park, as you can probably hear in the background right yep. now. <laughs> um, so the opportunity for not just museum goers, but just people walking by who might say, oh, wait, what are you doing? And getting the chance to really get them involved with their history as well. Because if you're finding amazing things, but you aren't sharing that effectively with other people, it's not as amazing as it could be if you're sharing it with more people. Agreed. Cool. Well, Laura, thank you for sharing some of your excitement with our listeners, Absolutely. numerous as I hope they are. <laughs> and thank you for talking with me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Hi, Sean. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Please introduce yourself. Uh, so my name's Sean Campbell. I'm a fossil preparator at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, California. And you are, so what is, a, what is your job as a preparator? Uh, specifically, I work on excavating material at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, so we have a large project going on right now. It's called Project 23. There were 23 boxes that were generated out of a underground parking structure salvage project back in 2006, where they found 16 massive fossil deposits. And they were collected in a variety of ways, but a lot of that material was collected in 23 large crates that were created around them uh, as the deposits were pedestaled in the ground using huge construction equipment. And some of them were so large that they couldn't be captured all in one go, or they kind of fell apart in some instances, unfortunately. So they had to create 23 boxes to capture about 13 of the deposits. Some of the other ones were jacketed like in normal paleontology, normal. Quotations. Right, right. Um, so we are, so so we're actually sitting here on the grounds of the, of La Brea. Right, Hancock we're, Park. Hancock Park, right next to some of these big crates. So to give the, the listeners an image, this was the art museum parking structure, right? Yeah, so where the material came out of. So we're all county uh, facilities, so... The La Brea Tar Pits is an extension of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Right, right. And the Art Museum, way back in the day when we used to be the Museum of History, Science, and Art, back in the early 1900s when we opened our doors in 1913, uh, the Art Museum became its own entity in the late 50s and built their buildings here in the 1960s. So they, as a county institution under themselves, now have you know, rights to this area as well. And they've been building structures since the 60s. -hmm. So they came across this big asphalt deposit, this tar deposit. Multiple. Multiple deposits. many deposits. And so when when people think of excavation, right, at the Gray Fossil Site, which we like to talk about, which you got to visit, it's classic. We're digging it straight out of the ground where it came from. Mm -hmm. You are actually digging, you're excavating in giant wooden boxes right that were pulled up out of this deposit so your your field site right here is a crate right for me in particular so we do have in situ original deposition excavations such as pit 91 which is a historic pit mm-hmm. but also but the material that i pretty much work on exclusively myself is all of those wooden crates that you were talking about so all those deposits that were brought up out of the ground after they were pedestaled they actually hired a tree moving company to create the boxes surrounding them, and then the last thing they did was cut floors underneath and put in planks, nailed everything together, used metal bands to tighten it up, and then a crane pulled it out out of the ground and put it onto a truck that drove it over here, and then it put it back down into our compound. So this was done back in between 2006 to 2008. Um, the monitoring and all the excavation for that parking structure was finished in about three and a half months. It was very quick. Wow. And the third party firm, Archaeopaleo Incorporated, was actually charged with the task of monitoring the situation and making sure the collections got to the final repository, which was deemed to be the Librea Tarpets 
um, which just makes sense. Right, right. So, so you're doing unusual paleontology. A little bit, yeah. It's what kind is... of it's kind of a preparation of ginormous field jackets in a way that are made out of wood. But that's just because the deposits are so massive. You know, when you're working in an NC2 original deposition and you've got, you know, articulated or associated or isolated bones, you kind of just work on it as it goes. But these formations or these deposits form over thousands of years and the asphalt seeps that are just at the surface are essentially just collection zones. So material is getting mired and walking in. So in the case of lots of bison and horses, mammoths and mastodons, safe tooth cats, dire wolves, so on and so forth, they might be walking in and getting trapped and eventually dying and decomposing. But then we also have material getting washed in. So this is the LA Basin and that fluvial deposition coming off the mountains could not only bring sediment, but also bring remains as well. So plants, insects, most of our freshwater snails and shells, um, as well as some of our fish specimens are probably coming in that way most of the time. Um, so yeah, they they just keep forming over thousands of years, and it's just a collection zone with burial, and then asphalt and natural gases are exuding, and it becomes a little bit larger as time goes on. So our classic deposits are roughly conical in shape, and they're all custom. They're all various sizes, and um, but some of them are meters tall and meters wide. Wow. Uh, but a lot of them do taper down towards the middle or the chimney uh, source of the vent and asphalt started coming up to the surface. How did you end up here? So I went to school in San Diego, San Diego State, and I went through anthropology with an emphasis in human osteology, and I was kind of interested in probably getting into paleoanthropology at some point, and I also minored in geology at the same time. So okay. essentially I'm interested in rocks and bones, right. so La Brea is the perfect <laughs> place for me. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> La Brea is one of the most unique fossil sites in, you know, not only what's found here, but where it is and how you have to excavate. What is it like? You know, we're in the midst of a paleontology conference. What is it like to talk to other paleontologists when you're like comparing notes and comparing methods and you're working at such an unusual place? It is definitely an unusual place. And a lot of the times I'll actually get gasps from people seeing the deposits and how large they are and how many fossils. Because one of the major differences is the disarticulation of individuals and then the jumbling of remains over thousands of years with all the movement of the asphalt and natural gases moving through the deposits. Um, the asphalt itself is the reason for the preservation. So we have three-dimensionally perfect remains a lot of the time. Obviously, some of them are fragmented, but sometimes we get absolutely stunning, perfect remains that are not compressed or anything and then also because the asphalt and oil uh, the, is essentially a crude oil and the oil and water don't mix we don't have any permineralization or replacement um, it's pr kind of just the perfect setting to preserve and protect these fossil remains and some of them have all the way up to 80 percent of their original bone collagen so when i'm excavating wow. it's actually the bones <laughs> of that saber-toothed cat or that mammoth or mastodon or whatever it may be that I'm pulling, or wood, or, you know, chitin, or calcium carbonate of shells, or whatever it is. It's actually that material. Uh, when we were on the tour, when Stephanie was showing us around, behind the scenes, giving us those numbers and such, mm -hmm. there were gasps on the tour. Because I asked her what the uh, the MNI, right, the minimum estimated number of individuals for Smilodon is. And she said 3,000. Yeah, thousands. And that's that's insane. Yeah. It's kind of the perfect data set, right? That's what you want when yeah. you go to a <laughs> when you want to do research <laughs> at, a, at a site. Is you want to see because not only is it but it is it thousands of individuals that are re represented at the Labrador Tarpits, but we have all the way to very very young juvenile animals, all the way to elderly adults, and everything in between. Right, right. So as far as studying the ontogeny and the development of that animal. This is the perfect place to come. And carnivores are so rare in the paleo record. And here, because it's a carnivore trap, and there's about that 9 to 1 ratio of every large herbivore, you're going to find 9 large carnivores right, because right. of all the scavenging and predation that was going on. Um, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. 
And for you as a preparator, right, your job is excavating and preserving, right, right, stabilizing and cleaning the fossils. Correct. Data collection, all right, that sort right. of stuff. You must have to have a wealth of knowledge to work with such a variety of fossils and such a variety of preservation Mm -hmm. uh, levels of preservation mm -hmm. is it just are you an encyclopedia of of preparation knowledge <laughs> i don't know if i'm the best encyclopedia i'm one of those worn out books in the library okay. I guess. I don't, <laughs> but uh yeah to work here there's 600 about 650 species that have been identified that is a large amount um, so that includes everything all the plants insects and vertebrate remains um, what i normally am coming across and what my curator is expecting me to measure out as far as coming out of the deposit are generally larger vertebrate remains. So we've kind of made this arbitrary distinction of, okay, for mammals, coyote size and bigger. For birds, about crow or hawk size and bigger. That's what you're going to measure every element, regardless, regardless of what that element of the skeleton is and okay. how small it is. If you can identify it as a species of that specific species that large, I want you to measure it. But anything smaller... All the rodents, rabbits, moles, voles, um, little tiny lizards, and teeny tiny songbirds. I can see that as I'm excavating, but I'm not expected to measure and identify down to a species level everything right. as it's coming out. That's, 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 that's for the collections managers right, right, later right. on down the line, yeah. <laughs> but I'm expected to excavate and organize everything, project, uh, deposit, grid, level, all of that has to be organized so we know exactly where that material came from. And then once that does get processed, that'll, that'll just be further steps along the road as far as it goes to excavations, then it goes to lab. After the lab's done with it, it'll go to collections. And then after collections is done with it, it should be ready for researchers, for anyone who wants to come and study whatever material is coming out of here. How many preparators are there on staff here? So... Right now, it's the summer, so we actually have two temporary uh, full-time members uh, to excavate down in Pit 91. So we have uh, four people that work full-time year-round outside. We have two that work temporary on Pit 91. We have two that work in the lab. Um, so just preparator-wise, we have about eight people plus um, an assistant preparator right now who you're going to meet later, um, right, right. Stevie. So we have like kind of eight and a half preparators. And then as far as the staff of other departments, we have two collections managers, an assistant collection manager. We have uh, three postdocs, uh, kind of a fourth that's on their own grant. And then we have our full-time curator, Dr. Emily Lindsay, and we're about to get our second curator, uh, Dr. Reagan Dunn, is going to start um, July 1st. And right now you are, right. and when I say right now, I mean... I interrupted you in the midst of it, are running the field school. Yes. So this is actually the second field school that's ever been run at La Brea. Oh, nice. So last year was a success, and we've continued it on into this year. So we do it during the summer, usually mid-June to mid-July. We take generally 12 students um, that go through the IFR program, uh, International Field Research Program. And they get college credit, and they're coming through us to get this experience and work through our materials. And they get to do excavations, lab preparation, and uh, work in collections, as, and as well as 3D scanning of wow. bones. So the, I know at the Great Fossil Site, you all have an Arctic spider. We have one of our own. Oh, yeah? yeah. For scanning? For scanning. So we have one of our preparators actually uses that on a constant daily basis because so much material is going out for destructive analysis. Very cool. What a great opportunity for students to get to work, not just at an active fossil site, but at this active fossil site. Right. Yeah. So this this active fossil site has been active on and off for over 100 years. Um, so the first excavations were from the very early 1900s. Um, so the like a brief history of La Brea is the Berkeley Museum was here, or the Berkeley uh, School was here as well as the Southern California Academy of Sciences. The LA High School was doing excavations here. Um, so we have a variety of entities that were coming and doing excavations here prior to 1913. But then when 1913 happened, the Natural History Museum, again, back then it used to be known as the History of uh, the, the Museum of History, Science, and Art, that's when the Hancock family decided to give 
that museum exclusive rights uh, to excavate as much as they wanted. And eventually they deeded the property out to the county so that that county institution could use it for perpetuity and uh, continue preserving and collecting all the specimens and protect the area, which was, it's because of the Hancock family that the site exists the way that it does. Otherwise, yeah. it might be underneath the rest of the city. Yep. Yeah. And hence the name of this park we're sitting in. Yep. Hancock Park. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> Sean, what's your favorite thing about working at La Brea? Excavating, for sure. Finding, yeah. finding something and uh, being the first person to ever see and touch a specimen that's thousands of years old. Um, and being able to look at past ecologies and ecosystems that are being preserved in such exquisite detail and then turning around and, and being able to communicate that to the general public or other researchers or other preparators or other people from other institutions I, f I just find a lot of joy and pride in all the work that I do so it's, it's just a ton of fun awesome do you have a favorite specimen that you've gotten to either find or work on I love the sloths yeah, yeah. so <laughs> they're just so strange and weird and I love them um, so we have three different species of ground sloth found at La Brea. We have the Jeffersons, the Shasta, and the Paramylodon Harlan's ground sloth, Paramylodon harlani. And the Harlan's ground sloth was the largest at La Brea, as well as the most abundant. Um, so nice. the two deposits that we're currently working on for Project 23, Box 13 and Box 9, both contain a large adult um, individual. And we're finding multiple vertebrae, ribs... Uh, and it looks like we have some skull material coming out of box 13, which is really exciting. Oh, nice. Very, very fun for you. Tons of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Skulls are all obviously always nice, but we find everything here. So that's, that's a plus. That's awesome. Sean, thank you so much for talking with me. Yeah. Thanks for sitting down and having this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Hello, Connie. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Oh, no, thank you. Please explain, uh, introduce yourself and what your position is. Sure. So, hi, my name is uh, Connie Clark. I work as a preparator in the fossil lab at the La Brea Tar Pits, and I have been for about a year. Very oh. cool. So, are you sort of the new the new kid on the block there? I am, I am the new kid on the block at the Tar Pits. <laughs> you know, people come to the Tar Pits and then they stick around. I'm sure you've heard that <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. I, Yes, we have. <laughs> I yeah, that. trot that out a lot. Yeah. So, what are your responsibilities in the lab? So, I help um, train and sort of supervise volunteers, a really great pool of volunteers, and I do some fossil preparation myself. And so that's basically what I spend all day doing is talking fossils with people who are really interested. <laughs> is your, so, so are your responsibilities different, you being newer, are you sort of, is there a ladder? Are you still working your way up? I am still working my way up. So um, I wasn't really expecting a career in paleontology. So I was expecting to be more of a plant person. So I originally oh, wow. thought I would go to school for plant biology. And then I started volunteering at the tar pits. So I'm learning animals. <laughs> and and learning bones. A... And that just, yeah, threw me for a loop. <laughs> threw a wrench into everything. Yep. <laughs> do you get to work on plants at La Brea? We do have a lot of plants. Um, in the lab at the moment, we're not really focusing on preparing plants uh, just because we have a lot of research ongoing with the animals. And But we are getting a new paleobotanist. I'm Ooh. sure you've heard we're hiring a new curator. So hopefully we'll be preparing more plants in the future. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Very nice. It'll be nice to see the plant community. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot to look at there. Are you from this area? I am. I'm from L.A. Grew up here pretty much all my life. Went to college around here. So, <laughs> Well, is it, so do you get to, La Brea being such a big deal nationally and internationally, do you get to interact with a lot of people from various places? I do, yeah. So because I'm in the lab and that's kind of where the researchers come in and start their mm -hmm. studies, I get to meet a lot of them. So we have, you know, really great pool of pool of researchers who come and study and we get to kind of meet and talk to them and they give talks or we force them to give talks <laughs> <laughs> since they're already there um yep. yeah so it's so we get to meet a lot of people nice yeah. my understanding is that the preservation at la brea right it's it's asphalt it, it, that's weird and it's it difficult to work with but you've been volunteering there for a while so it must be that, that must be a nice position for you to be in. You kind of were raised on that stuff. I, yeah, raised on asphalt preservation. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's an interesting substance. You know, I just, you work with it and then 
when I got hired, I started actually thinking like, oh, what is this actually? And it's like, oh, this is a really complex mixture of stuff. And it behaves differently depending on a lot of different conditions. And so, you know, kind of our challenge in the lab is to figure out the ways to remove it without taking too much away because it is the preserving agent. So we want to keep as much in there as possible. Oh, wow. And so it's kind of, we're just trying to take the right amount out and leave the rest of it in. But the, Run some of the problems with gooey fossils. I yeah. had one recently that it just did a little bit of solvent and then it just started like almost gushing asphalt. So Ooh. it could be fun. That <laughs> oh, wow. sounds yeah. fun and frustrating. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a really great preserving agent. We can remove it chemically, so I don't have to worry about damaging the bone too much. That's very know, nice. As opposed to zip scribes or stuff like that. So hmm. yeah. Do you have a favorite specimen that you've gotten to work on? Oh, I really like. Um, the dwarf antelope we have. We've been preparing some Capromeric jaws and just the little tiny teeth in the jaws are just really, really fascinating to see and work with. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Hoping to start doing some more plants though. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you have a favorite kind of plant? We have a lot of juniper and in the microfossils we're actually finding um, a lot of different seeds and we're getting those identified so it's really fun to see the occasional like manzanita or elder berry or a lot of juniper still but yeah yeah that's great do you think so so whenever i picture a fossil locality and i think of the tar pits and, and i picture what it was like 20 30 40 thousand years ago i'm always focusing on the animals yes because i'm very we're vertebrate biased yeah, as is bit. well known when you picture the the site are you seeing the plants more is that sort oh. of a different perspective I try to just because, you know, LA is, I grew up in LA, so I grew up kind of hiking around and we see a lot of the same, or we have evidence of a lot of the same plants. So like when I find an elderberry, it's really nice to imagine that tree, you know, 50,000 years ago is the same as the one in the garden today that we have. So it's, but I mean, the animals are very charismatic. So I always imagine a sloth <laughs> eating that elderberry. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the plants, it's the, the interactions. Yeah. Right, you're imagining yeah. the whole ecosystem try to it could be a little <laughs> it's a yeah. lot it's yeah. a lot you know ecosystems are pretty pretty big but yeah cool yeah. what is your favorite thing about working at the La Brea Tar Pits I have to say the community is my favorite thing so we have a really fantastic pool of volunteers and some really fantastic staff and I feel like I've just learned so much from all of them so we have a lot of different backgrounds on the staff and the volunteers and it's just everyone has like a unique perspective that they bring to the lab and it's and they bring to the tar pits and it's really fascinating to hear kind of their takes on what we're doing and what's happening in the world. Awesome. Nice. Sounds like a really, really cool place to work. I feel so lucky every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're lucky to have had you share your perspective with oh, us. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thanks for yeah. joining us. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Hello, field school. Hello. <laughs> Dr. Lindsay, please uh, explain briefly what the tar pits field school is. So the field school is an intensive four-week course in which students learn uh, the fundamentals of excavation, uh, fossil preparation, vertebrate skeletal morphology, collections management, paleoecology, and science communication. Okay, excellent. Now I'm going to walk down the line and have each person just introduce yourself, uh, your name, where you're from, what you study, and then answer, please, what is your favorite thing about working, uh, uh, participating in the Tar Pits Field School? So we'll start with you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Madeline. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I will be a senior at the University of Southern California in the fall studying geology. And my favorite thing about volunteering and participating in the field school is to get firsthand a glimpse into what the world was like before we lived in it. <laughs> Excellent. That's a good reason. Um, hello, my name is Sophia Muller. I um, graduate with this course, and okay. I've studied evolutionary biology and Near Eastern art and archaeology. Um, my favorite thing about this field school is just contributing to their research, and I really enjoy their science communication practices and their philosophy on that. Awesome. That's nice for us to hear. Yes. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, my name is David Arona. I go to the University of Calgary, but I'm from Los Angeles, and I'm getting a Bachelor's of Science in Archaeology. 
And my favorite thing about the field school is just how spoiled I am based on the amount we can excavate because we have so much to choose from that we just have to like stop and work in another corner and I know that I'm going to miss that when I'm doing everything else. <laughs> yeah, that's not typical in paleontology yeah. or archaeology. Hi, uh, my name is Maisie Dawson. I'm from England in the UK and I'm going to my third year undergrad studying biology. Um, I think probably my favorite thing about the tar pits is you have such an amazing mix of expertise. Um, I haven't studied paleontology or archaeology before, so it's amazing to sort of glean knowledge of other people that have different backgrounds and have different careers in paleontology as well. Excellent. Hi, I'm Abby Schofield. Uh, I am three years into a five-year BA MA program in archaeology at Boston University. Um, my favorite thing about this field school is definitely the environment and the instructors because I really feel like everyone is willing to learn something and help you learn something, and so it's really refreshing to have that. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ajay Galvez. I'm from Mexico. I just finished up my associate's degree at Riverside Community College in anthropology. My favorite thing about the Librea Tar Pits is its goal to demystify science. And it does so through its fishbowl lab and through its excavations open in the park. Excellent, excellent. Hi, my name is Danielle Hum. I'm originally from Montreal, Canada, but I'm studying in the UK, specifically, Arche um, specifically Oxford University. I'm pursuing a PhD in archaeology there. So what I really love about this field school is a wonderful opportunity to work both in the field, in the lab, to see, well, free range, uh, asphaltic sites, as well as actually to go to conferences it basically gives us opportunity to really see all these different environments and professionals just working and well together essentially. Awesome. It's a, it sounds like a great professional development opportunity. Oh, definitely. Uh, my name is Daniel Dubow. I'm a student at Ohio State University uh, in anthropology. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And my favorite thing about the tar pits is um, it's just being able to engage openly with the public and have them see what paleontology and archaeology are from start to finish. You get to see people excavating fossils, you get to see them taken to the lab, you get to see them cleaned, and then you get to see the displays that come all the way at the end of the process. Excellent. And I just thought of a surprise question, so I'm going to walk back over to Dr. Lindsay. What is your favorite thing about having the field school? You know, we have amazing students, and people come, they're so enthusiastic, they're so bright, and people are coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. I love seeing how everybody comes together and helps each other to learn different material based on their different strengths. And I love that the Tar Pits can offer a really broad training ground so students, as you can see, are interested in a lot of different things. Some are really into the excavation, some are really into collections, some are really into science communication. And so it has sort of something for everyone and it probably has something that surprises everyone that they didn't even know they wanted to learn about. But it's definitely, it's a wonderful opportunity for me, you know, as a curator, I don't, teach classes. I'm not based in a university, so this is where I get to have that sort of part of my profession uh, leveraged, and um, it's just wonderful. Excellent. It sounds like a great program. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for talking with us, and I think that we're going to put this part at the end of this recording. Yeah. So say goodbye to our listeners, please. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.